Good morning. Good to see you. And uh, here we are two weeks into the new year. You know, I got a question for you. I had to ask, how you doing with your New Year's resolutions? Now, now remember, you're safe here. It's the potter's hand. No judgment zone. Only God's word can do the judging here. How many people would be bold enough and honest enough to raise your hand and say, I've already blown my New Year's resolution? Anybody? Just me? Really? That's a, thank you, Kelly. God bless you. Just two spirit. Courtney? Amen. Anyone else? I see that hand. Yes? Okay. Three, three honest people. That's awesome. All right. Well, here's, you didn't make any? Well, that's kind of the easy way out, isn't it? You didn't either? Well, what are we doing? Let's just go. When, <laughs> when, if you didn't make one, this is for you. Okay? Or if you broke yours already, three honest people, and you'd like a new one, I, may I suggest one? I have one. I have one for you. I, I, I think we could all maybe do this. <laughs> call, call me crazy. But yes. Oh, yes. You should applaud that. When you are tested in the fires of life behind the wheel of your car, and you are waiting at that intersection, and this right lane just keeps coming and coming and coming, and you know you're never going to get across, and there's an opening, and you look to the left, and you see one slow car. And he's coming, you're thinking, you know what, I'm going to be nice, and I'm not going to pull out in front of this guy. I'm going to wait for him to come, and come, and come. And, you, and there goes your window, and you could have gone 18 times. And then at the last second, he turns, and he doesn't use his turn signal. Admit it. That flies all over you, right? Please tell me that's not just me, because I've been there. And some of us, we turn into this right here. This is what we do when it's, it is on. It's called a blanker. So if you, don't, if you don't have a New Year's resolution and you would like one, might I suggest one? Just, just, just for free. No, no, I am so glad you're here today. I don't believe it's a coincidence that you came out and braved the almost icy weather today. God is going to do something amazing. And I want to talk to you about something for a minute. What would God say to you if you asked him this question right here? What matters to you, God? What would God say? How would he answer that if you said, what do you really care about? What is really important to you? See, that's what we're going to look at. As we, as we dive into these scriptures today, we're going to see, as you study the Bible, it reveals a God who is on an all-out search for two kinds of people. He is on an all-out, flat-out search. And I'm not talking about like a casual shopper, like, look, oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. I'm not talking about window shopping. I'm talking all-out, hardcore. You're looking for those heels or something that you know is on sale, and they got a BOGO sale, and you are fired up, and you are intense about it. Or guys, you're looking for that hunting rifle or something. This is, this is a full-on search mode, calling the neighbors. God is on the move, and he is super intense about something. Two categories. And here's the deal. Every one of us in this room is in one of these two categories. So if I piqued your curiosity, I won't leave you in suspense long. I'm going to tell you what these two categories are. I'm going to tell you one of them right up front. And by the end of today, you're going to be able to diagnose which category you're in right now and the one you also want to be in if you want to change. All right? That's what we're looking at today. I won't keep you in suspense. The first one of these all out that God is on all out search for are the kind of people he can use. And these are the fully committed. These are the hardcore disciples whom Jesus can count on day in and day out. Is that you? The second kind of people that God is looking for, we'll find it right here in Luke 15. And I think you'll be able to put it together. There's a, you're going to see why God is searching for fully committed people. And this is so deep. You might have read these passages before, but I bet you haven't seen them like this. Because this week I learned so much. Studying for this, I am so fired up. There is so much. This is the kind of story in Luke 15 that can change the direction of your life and reignite your passion and give you purpose. So let me set the context of what we're going to read. You can go ahead and open your Bibles if you want to Luke 15 or pull up your favorite Bible app. Luke 15 is a record of Jesus telling three stories. Three stories right here. The first one is the parable of the lost sheep. The second one is the parable of the lost coin, and the third one is the parable of the lost son. Three stories that he shares in rapid-fire succession. We're going to talk about these two today, and next week you've got to come back to hear the one in the middle, and you'll see why the one in the middle is often picked to be the most favorite passage of many believers the world over and all of Scripture. This is incredible. Here's the first thing I want you to see before we read the Scripture. 
Every time Jesus shares a parable, almost without exception, he shares the story, and then he goes right away into explaining what that story means. Jesus doesn't do that here. He does something very bizarre. Instead of explaining what the parable is, he goes right into the next one. And then the next one. There's no stop. There's no pause. There's no sippy cup break. There's no potty break for his listeners. He is like, pachoom, pachoom, pachoom. And he's firing these truth grenades at people. And you gotta, you got to know his audience. It's the Pharisees again. And the scribes, his favorite people. Remember, they're still smarting from last week when we looked at Luke 14 where they were complaining about Jesus is hanging out with all those deplorables and all those icky people and all those sinners and tax collectors. Yeah, because the, the well don't need a doctor. And they're still mad at him for that. And they're disappointed in him. And so Jesus launches into three parables back to back that stun this crowd. These stories are so deep, church, hear me. And they are so carefully woven. The words Jesus chooses are not an accident. They are so specific. I wish I could unpack all three of them, but we're going to look at two of them. And you're going to see why this is so powerful. And today, in fact, go ahead and open your Bibles. Let's just dive in. I'm going to read from the MSG translation, starting in verse 1 of chapter 15. He says this, By this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and religion scholars were not pleased. Ooh, not at all pleased. They growled, he takes in sinners and eats meal with them, treating them like they're old friends. Their grumbling triggered this story. I love how that's written. He says, suppose one of you had 100 sheep and lost one. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the lost one until you found it? And when you found it, you could be sure that you would put it across your shoulders, rejoicing. And when you got home, you would call in your friends and your neighbors saying, celebrate with me. I found my lost sheep. Count on it. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people in no need of rescue. Verse 8. Or imagine a woman who has 10 coins and she loses one. Won't she light a lamp and scour the house, looking in every nook and cranny until she finds it? And when she finds it, you can be sure she'll call her friends and her neighbors and say, celebrate with me. I found my lost coin. Count on it. That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. Mm -mm -mm. No, it's, it's powerful stuff. Don't miss the obvious here, okay? Who's Jesus' audience at this point? Talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. Remember, the Pharisees were not fair, you see. They were very, very unfair. They were very judgmental. They were the devout religious leaders of the day. And they were stuffy. And they were the orthodox, ultra-orthodox Jews. And they looked down their noses, frankly, at anybody who wasn't like them. So Jesus knows what's in their heart. And he knows that these Pharisees look down on shepherds as second-class citizens. No rightful Pharisee would ever be around sheep herders because it is a smelly, stinky job. And it's looked down upon, in their eyes, as a second-class job. So Jesus comes up, and he shocks them straight out of the gate to get their attention. And he says, suppose you were a shepherd with 100 sheep. And right away, the Pharisee's like, time out. Time out. Let me, let me just stop you right there, Jesus, <clears throat> rabbi. That's what people are starting to call him, and it's making these Pharisees mad. He's not a rabbi trained like we are. And he says, you know what, just let me stop you there, Jesus, because I know where you're going. And I want to stop you and say, none of us are anything about what you're talking about. So you can just save your breath because we're not shepherds. We would never be shepherds. We wouldn't even associate with that. So many. And if we did have sheep, we would hire somebody to come and watch them. And Jesus knows this, and he knows how they feel about looking down on smelly sheep herders. So he shocks them, and he has their full attention, but he's not done. He goes on. The second shock comes. When in verse 4, look, he says, suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses one of them. Now, here's the, here's the hidden gold that so many of us miss in America because we don't speak in these dialects. But in Middle Eastern cultures, just like in ancient Spanish, saving face is so important. It's not, a, it's not an arrogant or a prideful thing per se. It's, just, it's almost a, an old school respect. You would never embarrass somebody, and you would never save face. If you were describing a sheep that had strayed, you would never say, suppose the shepherd lost one of them. To help save face, what you would say is, suppose one of your sheep got lost. Suppose one wandered off. Does that make sense? If you speak Spanish, and some of you, let's say you're at a dinner party, and you got a plate, and you accidentally drop it on the ground, and it shatters. You would say, say, Ropio, oh, the plate broke itself. How'd that happen? 
You would never say, I broke the plate, unless you intentionally and specifically wanted to point the finger at yourself, indict yourself, and admit to your own clumsiness. You see what's happening here? Let me put it in modern terms. Imagine a politician today. If they get caught in something illegal or immoral or unethical, you will almost never hear them say, I made a mistake. What do they say? It's my favorite. Yeah, mistakes were made. <laughs> Believe me, I'm just as upset about it as you are, right? Right? That's what they say. They would never, they would never own up to their own mistakes. Goodness, even Ron Burgundy will own up to his own mistakes and say, I immediately regret this. But not the Pharisees. So over here in English, we say, I broke the plate. But in Spanish, you'd say, the plate broke itself. It's the same thing in Jesus' day. In those Middle Eastern languages, they wouldn't say, I lost a sheep. Instead, every time you would say, the poor sheep got lost. But here, Jesus doesn't do that. He does something so bizarre, and unless somebody points it out to you, you don't realize the impact of this. What he says here is so emphatic. He says, oh, no, 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 no. One didn't wander off. You lost the sheep. You, the shepherd, you own this. You have the responsibility. Again, the Pharisees are like, not me. I'm not going to imitate this guy. Why are you even telling this story, Jesus? This is so far removed from us. And to make it even worse, this shepherd loves sheep. He actually cares. Sweet little sheep. He actually cares for me. He loves them. So let me ask you a couple questions. Make sure you're with me. In this story, how many sheep does the shepherd start off with? 100, right? Yeah, these aren't trick questions. They're easy ones. Okay, what happens to one of them? Exactly. One wanders off. He loses it. It gets lost. He leaves the other 99 out in the open country. He doesn't go back and corral them. He doesn't take them into someplace city or bring them into a safe place. He leaves them there in potential danger to go and find and search for the one that's lost. That fact alone tells you a lot about his heart. He goes and he finds the sheep and he puts the sheep on his shoulders. And he cares. I don't, I don't, it's a bunny, I get it. But it's <laughs> pretend it's a sheep today, okay? I didn't have a sheep. And what does scripture say? He says he takes it, he puts it over his shoulders, and he brings it home. And when he does, he calls his friends. And he's so happy, he says, Rejoice with me, I found my sheep. I found my sheep. You got to come. We're going to throw a party. This is going to be the best day. And he's so excited. He goes and he gets his sheep and he calls his friends and he says, quote, celebrate with me. So let me ask us, how about you? How about me? How genuinely happy and excited do we get when a lost person comes to faith in Christ? How genuinely excited do we get when we share our faith with someone or we share a testimony of how we were once lost and how God found us? How genuinely excited are we when we see them come to faith? Well, maybe for some of us, we've never been excited at all because we've never seen that. We've never come to the place in our life where we've shared that story. We didn't share our testimony. Might I challenge us to make 2019 the year that you step up and you live a bolder life with greater significance and you share your testimony and you share your faith with that person at work that you know has been on your heart or that person at school that you know needs to hear about Jesus or that person in your family, even the annoying one that you only see at holidays, Cousin Eddie. Cousin Eddie needs Jesus too. What do we do? You want to reclaim your passion and your true significance in life? Share the gospel with someone who's lost. And if God gives you the opportunity to watch them become found, I promise you it will fire your jets. You will see a new significance for living that you've never found. And you will sense God's smile on you. And, and if you get to come and, and they have those baptismal waters and you see the old person go under and you see them come up, you will rejoice and you will shout just like the angels in heaven. And you will see why we clap and we cheer and we shout because this one who was lost is now found. And it is a big deal. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've never shared. Or maybe you have accepted Christ and you've made the commitment to be a follower of him for life. But you've never followed through in baptism. We're going to be doing that in just a couple weeks. On February 3rd, you can join us. Come talk to me. This is a great chance to make a public profession and say, you know what? I am all in. 2019 is going to be a different year. I am so just fed up with my mediocrity. I am moving forward. 
See, this is what happens. This is exactly what it says the angels do. Verse 7 says, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And there's a word we don't hear much. The Greek word for repent is metanaeo. It's a beautiful, powerful verb. And it, it, it means to totally reverse your beliefs and change your direction of your life. This is such a strong word. It means you're going in an entirely new direction. This is so much more significant than what we give it credit for. We don't just say, you know, you know, I think I might change my mind on sin. <laughs> I might veer this way. I think I'm going to cut down on the amount of sin. It's not about that. This is about true repentance, and that's what leads to this incredible euphoria in heaven. It is a total and complete reversal and a new direction. Anybody want that? Let me put it in a modern thing you can understand. How many people know the Ghostbusters? Anybody? Yeah, you know the Ghostbusters. Anybody remember Egon? Egon? Egon Spangler? Yes, yes. By the way, if you don't know, that guy on the left is our worship leader. That's Jason. Worship leader extraordinaire. And he looks like, and, and I got his permission, and he put this on Facebook, so. There's a scene in Ghostbusters where Egon's given this great, great lesson to, uh, to Bill Murray's character. I forget his name, but he, he's not the brightest. And he says, whatever you do, don't cross the streams. Why? It would be bad. <laughs> I'm fuzzy on the whole good, bad thing. What does that mean? He says, imagine every molecule in your body instantly and spontaneously exploding at the speed of light if you cross the streams. It is a total protonic reversal that happens here. And this is the picture I get. This is how weird your pastor is. But this is the picture I get when I think of repentance, when we are serious. We do a total protonic sin reversal. We confess our sin to God. We agree with him on it that it's bad. That's bad. And we walk 180 degrees away from the sin, and we say, no more. I am done with that. I am serious about following Christ because the cross was real, and it really hurt, and he really took my pain, and he really took my death and my sin and my penalty, and he nailed it there. And I am serious, and I'm going to agree with God, and I'm going to turn in repentance. And here's the bonus. Look at the upper left corner. Look how mad the devil gets when he loses his grip on you. Just look at that. It's a win-win. It's a beautiful picture there. Now, for the second parable, he talks about the lost coin. Notice the star of this one. First one, he's talking about a shepherd, a male. But in this one, he's talking about a woman. Now, we don't get this because we're not this arrogant and chauvinistic today. But back then, Jesus is talking to men in this story. And not just any men, Pharisaic men. If they looked at shepherds as second-class citizens... They looked at women as third-class citizens. They're even worse than smelly shepherds in their eyes. That's how out of touch these Pharisees had gotten. Now, what does the woman have that's of value to her? Ten coins. Ten coins. Okay, now let's, let's do a quick math thing. How many sheep did the shepherd have in the first story? One hundred. How many coins does the lady have? Ten. See what happened? Jesus is reducing the proportions here. Don't miss this. This is gold. This is going to come back in the end. Jesus is reducing the portions. Now, what we don't realize is back in the agrarian societies and back in the Middle East, coins were incredibly rare. They didn't use them as money like we do today. Their preferred trade was barter. You know, hey, you want some chickens? Cool, man. Here, you can have a goat, and we'll trade. We'll swap out and throw in an Xbox, and I'll give you my cart and my ox and stuff. And they have all these things settled up, and they would know you would never, never, never give away your precious, rare silver coins or your gold unless you absolutely had to, unless it was a necessity. In fact, the women, they said they would take them and they would actually string them around their neck and keep them so that they were close to the heart. And this was their money. Sometimes this was their dowry, their bride gift. And they would keep these for extreme circumstances. So if you lost one, it was a big deal. The Greek word used here is drachma for coin. Now we say drachma, cool, all right, whatever. We think it's quarter. Oops, I dropped my quarter. Drachma back then was a day's wage. Okay, it didn't register. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put it in modern terms for you. Let's assume everybody in here makes $52,000 a year, okay? Some make more, some make less, some are happy with that, some are really sad about that right now. But let's just assume for easy math, $52,000 is our average salary. That's $1,000 a week. If you do a five-day work week, that's $200 a day. So when this lady drops her coin she drops a $200 coin. I don't know about you, 
but I'm stopping, and I'm picking up a coin worth 200 Benjamins. Anybody with me? Think about that. This is a big deal. I have here a real live $50 bill. Okay? Yes, a real $50 bill. Just got to make sure. Amy gave it to me. So. Okay. I love you, baby. This? Yeah, it's got the little band. $50 bill. Is there anyone here who was walking around, would drop this and go, oh, whoops, <laughs> and keep going? Elliot, get away. <laughs> now imagine if this was a $100 bill. Now double that. You see where we're going with this? This was a big deal. Why is Jesus talking about it? this? Is, this is just a 50, but if this was four times 50, multiply by four, this would be a big deal. So what do I do with this 50? I'll tell you what, are there any youth here, any students or children who have their Bible with them, it's open or they have their Bible app, and they've been taking notes? If you can show me you've been taking notes with a bullet, seriously? All right, so let me see. Ooh, nice. Congratulations. That is yours. Good job. Yeah. That's cool, man. That's cool. And knowing her parents, I am not surprised at all that she is doing that. That's a good family right there. Who says it doesn't pay to come to church? <laughs> Tell you what. So hear me. It is a big deal when Jesus says this coin is lost. Because notice her reaction. She panics. She grabs a broom and she starts sweeping the house. Remember, it's dark there because they didn't have a lot of interior windows. So she's got to light a lamp. It's very specific. Everything Jesus says is for a reason. This is so crazy. So what does she do when she finds it? She, yeah, she has a party. She calls her friends. She says, "Woo, come on. Let's have a party. Let's celebrate. So in these first two, does anybody see a trend? Right out of the gate, we see something's lost. Something's found. There's much rejoicing and there's a party. So we've got a trend happening. Jesus then goes on and tells a third story. We didn't read it today because we're going to dive into it next week hardcore. But just suffice it to say, it's a story of a father who has two sons. Okay? So let's do the math again. 100 sheep, 10 coins, two sons. Do you see what's happening? Jesus is doing, he is walking them right down this path and those Pharisees don't even know it's happening. He's reducing the proportions. He is saying, there is nowhere for you to hide. I'm going to bring this closer to home. Look at these ratios. You do the math. One out of 100. Okay, all right, well, there's room for me to hide in that. One out of 10, let's get closer to home. One out of two. I'm not talking about your neighbor. I'm talking about you. It's just you and him. And he is reducing these portions, and he is driving home the importance of rescuing the lost to these guys. One of the two sons gets lost, but he turns up again, and when he does, his father runs to him, and he's so excited, he throws the mother of all parties to celebrate. Why? Because he's so happy. That's what he does. He's a happy guy. This is that part where he comes and he says, rejoice with me. I'm so happy. Why are you not rejoicing? This is, he was lost. You know, all right, so we got these three stories. I want to summarize it, and I want to begin the application of this today and why Jesus told these. There's four things you need to know. If you're a note taker, get ready. Here they come. In each of these stories, the plot line involves something that was lost. We think that's real simple to grasp. Don't miss what's happening here. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son who's wandered away from home. I want you to go sometime, look in your Bible, and if you're one of those that takes notes in your Bible, look and circle how many times Jesus uses the word lost loses or loss in there. It will shock you how important he is driving home this word. Number two, what is lost matters greatly to the hero of the story. Oh, now this is starting to get on those Pharisees' nerves. Why do you care so much about these smelly sheep? It's just a coin. We have tons of them at the temple. And he's going on. He's saying, guys, the shepherd is so concerned about the loss of this one sheep, he risks the other 99 to go find him. This woman is so distraught over the loss of one coin, she cancels all her bridge parties. She says, well, I'm not going out, and I scour the entire house until I find it. The father is so brokenhearted that his son has wandered away, he endures the scorn of the entire village by running to him and hiking up his robes and doing something so disgraceful. In each case, the lost person and thing matters so much to the one who lost it that it warrants a party. 
It warrants an all-out search and then a party. And in each of these, when what was lost is found, the hero is so happy, he throws this party to express their joy. And it is all-out euphoria. How about you? How do you feel when something lost is found? How do you feel when a lost person comes home to faith in Christ? Maybe that's a foreign concept because we've never really surrendered and said, God, you know what? Time is short. We're it. We are the ambassadors. When Jesus went back to the Father, he left the keys to the kingdom in your hands. <laughs> Look around you, Ellen. We are the Calvary. This is it. This is it. We're, it's you and I, which leads to probably the most profound. Number four, the hero is someone who wouldn't really be admired by these religious leaders. Ooh, that's an indictment on the leadership in that modern day. Think about this. The first hero is a shepherd, second-class citizen, not interested. The second one is a woman, back then a third-class citizen. The third's a father, and you think, oh, the Pharisees might admire this guy, at least he's a wealthy landowner, until he acts so undignified, he hikes up his robes, he exposes his ankles and his legs, which he didn't do back then, and he runs out to meet a, a son who's disgraced him and scorned him and humiliated him, and he hugs him and he throws his big party, and the Pharisees say, nope, <laughs> change my mind, I'm not like him either. I, want, I don't want to ever be like these guys. So you put these four things together, what do you have? You have a beautiful picture of Jesus who's standing there dropping truth grenades on some stuffy, pious religious leaders who think they've got it figured out what matters to God. See, they know 2 Chronicles 16, 9. They've had this verse memorized since they were 10 years old. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are moderately committed to him. Oh, does yours not say that? Fully. Fully committed to him. They would have had this memorized. And here's the deal. They see themselves as the ones who matter to God. And frankly, if you don't measure up, they don't really care much about you. So Jesus, he's talking about the outcast in the society, and they're getting mad because he's calling himself rabbi, or others are calling him rabbi. And in their eyes, he's diminishing God's name. And the dignity that he is lessening here by associating with such low lives. And Jesus is so disappointed that they've missed it. Right over their head. So disappointed that they are so wrong in their thinking. He tells them not one, not two, but three rapid fire parables back to back as if to say, guys, your perception of what matters to God is so wrong. It is so far off from who matters and who doesn't that I am about to drop rapid-fire bazooka bombs into your soul so you will never forget this lesson. I'm not even going to stop to explain them. I'm going to start big to rope you in with 100. Then I'm going to go to 50 and 10, uh, 2. I'm talking about you. <laughs> now the truth is in their lap. And they have a choice to make. Do they accept this truth? It's the same choice we have when we are presented with the gospel. He goes on to tell them about things that are lost to people that they don't even care about, people that don't even matter to them. So what Jesus is saying is there's two kinds of people that God longs for and searches for. The first one I told you, that's the fully committed. And the second one, I bet you can put it together now. It's those who are lost. These are the two groups. Jesus is talking about them. There's the fully committed, and they're not the proud, self-congratulatory religious types that we read here with the Pharisees where we only value our religiosity. He's saying there's two things in this parable. First, lost people matter to God so much that he is on an all-out search for them. Every time a lost person is found, all of heaven rejoices. And we get to rejoice with the hero of the story, the hero of heaven, God himself. And secondly, and this is where it starts to hit home, get ready to be uncomfortable, the fully committed are those who understand this and rejoice with God when he finds what is lost so much so that the fully committed are willing to join the all-out search party. They're willing to go be out on the lookout. They've got their night lights and they've got their night vision and they're looking and they're on this search party. Can you see why it's so important when God says, my eyes are searching the earth to find every person who's fully committed to me? It's because God so loved the world that's those who have wandered away from his fatherhood, that he is now enlisting all his other children who are willing to join the search. 
Only the fully committed join the search. Only the fully committed reach out to the lost. Only the fully committed pray diligently for their friends by name who will otherwise spend a Christless eternity. Is that you? See, only the fully committed joyfully serve, sometimes long and late and unseen hours, serving in places to make this a place where the lost can be found. Only the fully committed will alter their spending habits so that they can faithfully offer God the full tithe he asks for to fund ministries that help reach the lost. Only the fully committed stay up late praying and begging God and dreaming up ways to go reach out to their lost neighbors and their lost friends. Only the fully committed stick around and help pull the wagon and not just ride in it. Only the fully committed come and commit and stick around for the long haul. They don't just drift in and stick around for six months or 12 get offended by something or someone, and then drift away. Only the fully committed fiercely protect the unity of their brothers and sisters by refusing to slander them, a person made in the image of God. Only the fully committed look out through eyes that sees as God does and sees thinking first about others and then second about themselves. Only the fully committed. So what about you? Are you among that group? Here's the good news. From Luke 15, we see the central mission of the church today. One of the core tenets, Jesus said, I am here to seek and save that which is lost. The good news is I look around this room and I can see almost everybody's eyes. And I see some people here who really get this. And it encourages me. I see some people here that truly get it. Yeah, sure, you might have problems. We all have struggles from time to time all over this room. But I am grateful that by and large, you are all here because you are saying to God, I want to be used by you. I want you to use this church to help me take those people from the other category, the lost people, and make them into disciples, fully committed. And so many people in this room get that and embrace that. And I see it. So here's my challenge to you. Okay? As we go through this new year, ask God to use us and to stoke this fire. For the next three weeks, I'm praying that you will make some concrete decisions. And you will pray about which spiritual camp you want to be in. And you will make a decision to invest your life with God. Because you realize it is the only life you have. This is it. Make it count. At the end of the day, doesn't matter how many deals are closed, doesn't matter how well liked you were. What matters is when we stand before the Lord, will He say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Check out your reward. Where you've stored up treasure after treasure after treasure, where thieves can't break in and steal, where moths don't come in and corrupt it, things don't rust. Real, tangible treasures. This is the only life we have. I hope in these next three weeks you will decide to build a relationship with your neighbors with your coworkers, with your family members who you know are estranged or lost. And then I want you to take the hidden step that people so often overlook. I want you to pray for them. Take that hidden step and pray and look for openings to invite them to places to hear the gospel. Invite them to church. Look, I get it. If you're not sure you can fully share the gospel or that, that is so foreign to you, man, I get that. I've been there. We've all been there as we grow in our faith. Just get them here and then together we'll share the gospel with them. In fact, here's, I'm going to make you a deal. If you know and you're praying for somebody, a family member or a coworker, or a friend, and you know they're coming and you've been inviting them, tell me and I'll pray with you. I will lay their name before the Father. In fact, there have been times where some of you have done that. You've come up to me Sunday morning, like countdown clock is going. You're like, Pastor Matt, you remember so-and-so I've been talking about? They're like, they're here. And I'm like, what? That's awesome. We hug, we rejoice. And then I look at my sermon and I went, oh, no. <laughs> It's a tithing sermon or something like that. What is that about, you know? And in a split second, I have seen God change the direction of my message to fully present the gospel because I knew there were so many lost people here. I always want to be sensitive to that. So I'm making that deal. Will you tell me? Will you let me know who you're praying for? 
In a minute, we'll have a chance to lay them at the altar, lay their names before the king and say, Lord, soften their hearts as you soften mine. Will you take that challenge? I hope you'll decide to make this church a place where those who are seeking him feel welcome. Getting to know these new faces that come, getting out of your comfort zone, coming early and shaking hands and getting some coffee and enjoying fellowship, getting to know, maybe even coming even earlier than that and plugging into a small group where you can truly have that coin in the fellowship. We started one last week. We had to bring out chairs. There were so many people. How are you doing with your commitment? See, 2019 can be your year. The Father is on an all-out search for those who are still outside his family. Will you do those things? I hope you will decide to manage your time so that you leave the most important hours protected. I hope you will decide to manage your money so that you will have such integrity that you can move toward a full tithe if you haven't done that yet so we can support more opportunities to touch lost people. God is looking for those whose hearts are fully his. Is that you? Let's pray about it. Would you bow with me? God, I thank you that your spirit is here. I thank you that your word yet again never returned void. And you have deep truth to reveal to us. I thank you for speaking to our hearts. Lord, I think there might be some of us here today who want to reaffirm our commitment to you. So, Lord, we do that here and now. God, I want to be fully committed to you. I want to be used by you to help rescue the lost that are so precious in your sight. We see it so clearly here in these three parables. Lord, I pray for every one of us here that you will give us opportunities to rescue the lost, that you will give us opportunities and, and help us not to miss those opportunities and chances to share our faith, to share the testimony of how we were once lost, but how you found us, how we may not be perfect, but we know someone who is, someone we can cling to. Lord, help us to seize those opportunities to invite people to come hear the gospel. And Lord, above it all, I pray that you would give us your heart for lost people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.